do this discussion of, of optical conductivity, but look at it from a different perspective um, and look at it in a different uh, regime. And this is a regime that's going to enable us to discuss um, deviations from mean field theory, uh, namely the idea of uh, phase fluctuations. And this was well motivated by trying to understand uh, what was the role of phase fluctuations uh, in the, what role did phase fluctuations play in the phase diagram of the cube rate superconductors and also other unconventional superconductors. And uh, I think this topic is still uh, important now. I, I know that Sudhir Sachdev was here earlier in the month um, and he's discussing uh, models of, of <coughs> superconductors uh, in which um, you could perhaps view the normal state um, as a uh, still within a phase fluctuation picture, but now uh, somehow the uh, phase fluctuations are taking place in a higher dimensional space than just the um, two-dimensional space of, of superconducting phase fluctuations to include fluctuations uh, into uh, CDW states. So in that, in that model, you, you view the normal state, the state above uh, transition temperature um, as a vector actually in, in, in that case um, in a six dimensional space and this vector is orbiting around uh, and uh, the question that, I, that one could pose is uh, what would be the experimental ramifications of this picture um, say beyond um, a more basic idea of competing phases or intertwined phases uh, that you would get from, um, say, a, you know, a more conventional uh, Ginsburg-Landau type picture. So that's at least one of the motivations why I wanted to um, look at this question of phase fluctuations, also because I think it's really uh, a fascinating topic with a really interesting uh, history. So. Um, what, what I want to do in the first part um, is to uh, review something that's probably very familiar to you. I really don't know. Uh, it's very old school physics, which is the um, uh, Anderson pseudospin model for uh, the uh, representation of VCS theory. Uh, and one of the reasons that I, I want to uh, introduce it, aside from the fact that I find it a very compelling physical picture that helps me understand superconductivity, uh, is that this very old uh, picture is being revived now in the area of um, the nonlinear optical response of superconductors, which is actually a very active field uh, with some very interesting experiments. So I wanted uh, at the end of, of my presentations uh, to, to acquaint you with that uh, theoretical and experimental work, which is actually being done in the context of this Anderson pseudo-spin model, uh, and then um, Sort of conclude with my assignment for you, which is to write a physical letter on this subject. So I think uh, <coughs> I'd be happy if you can do it uh, correctly and get a useful result. I'd be happy to put my name on it if, you, if you'd like <laughs> <laughs> sharing credit, but only if you insist. Um, so uh, okay, so so the um, let me start off with this Anderson pseudo spin model. Um, so uh, the Anderson pseudo-spin model uh, takes advantage um, of this idea of the BCS uh, coherent states. So you know that in BCS, um, the, the wave function is a, is a product of different K states. And it has the property that um, the time reverse pairs of states of a given momentum are either uh, occupied or uh, both occupied, that is K up and K down, are both occupied or both unoccupied, with zero probability amplitude <coughs> to be partially occupied. So you have this coherent superposition, and somehow in the, in the nature of this coherence, the fact that you're adding these uh, quantum mechanical amplitudes is really the entire key to uh, what we were talking about the other day, the persistent currents in superconductivity. Uh, in fact, you know, if you uh, uh, reflect on my lecture last time. So is anyone to make that bigger? I don't, yeah. I can just, 
I don't know how to make it. Uh, um, well, I'd have to keep going to the PDF and expanding it. Um, I can't see it. Huh? Um, let me see if it's. I think I repeat some of these things. What if you had a PDF mode, non display mode, would you? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, that's. I'm going to try it. I don't know. Yeah, well, that, that actually obviously would work. <coughs> my uh, lack of PowerPoint fluency is I exposed. Yet again, I'm sure. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, still, still Certainly will consume time as I fumble around with this stuff. It's better right now. Okay, yeah, so this is the uh, amplitude for them both to be unoccupied. This is the amplitude for them to be, to be occupied. Um, so what I was going to say is if you think, think back on uh, the lecture I gave last time, I, I mentioned, you know, persistent, uh, persistent currents and how amazing it was and um, uh, how it's a, such a surprising manifestation of the quantum world uh, uh, in our macroscopic um, environment. Um, but the, the, the derivation of this with BCS is just incredibly unsatisfying uh, when you consider and it all has to do with it, you know, you crank out this paramagnetic and diamagnetic term um, and um, the fact that you, um, you, you don't get a cancellation of the two terms uh, is, is the appearance of, um, of the persistent current. So that the lack of cancellation of the diamagnetic and paramagnetic terms in, the, in this linear response is probably the most unsatisfying explanation of this deep concept that you could come up with and it was really resisted in the early days of BCS. Uh, in fact, in the, in the, it was pointed out immediately after the BCS paper that this gave, the BCS paper gave you the wrong answer for the longitudinal response. And so there was quite a controversy. And this controversy was really put to rest by Anderson's uh, um, perceptive understanding of what, what the true basis of this theory was. And I think he, he arrived at that by thinking about this, uh, this the pseudo-spin version. So, what is, what is this Anderson pseudo-spin version? Um, so, what you can think of it as, a, as an experimentalist, the way I think about it, um, is that he defined um, a uh, state with, with both, ele with the, the, where you have double occupancy. So you have an electron in the state with k up and an electron in the state with minus k down. He defined that to be uh, um, spin up. And the state with them unoccupied, he defined it to be spin down. Now this, I know to you as theorists, um, you know, and I'm sort of embarrassed to be up on this podium here talking to you guys that know understand this a lot better than I do, but um, you can also think of this as a uh, formal uh, transformation from, uh, you have the Nambu spinner, and you have um, like this. So if you, and, you, and this state here, <coughs> So if these are the, so this is the formal transformation. I don't even know if Anderson used this language, but uh, if, you, if you do this uh, transformation from these uh, these Nambu formulation of these fermion operators, and this is these are the Pauli matrices, then this um, would be the uh, would be the spin. The so, spinor on the left has a dagger. What? The spinor on the left has a dagger. No. No, this is a Cooper pair. No? No, there's no diagonal. I knew I'd get into trouble immediately when I... Uh, <laughs> so, right. You know, uh, I advise you to think of this schematically, and I'm sure this is correctly in a lot of the textbooks. I'm just kind of using this as an ah, you know, sure, iconic sure. image to, <laughs> image to so you know what I'm talking about. And, um, if I knew how to get all the, the daggers and the spin-ups and spin-downs in the right place, I would have taken a different career path. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry. I was confused on the other for formulation. No, that's, yeah. that's, that's okay. I, knew, I, I thought this would... I, I was wondering whether I should even write this. I knew this would go there. Um, 
reaction. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, so sigma z. Uh, no, sorry, you're right. Nuts. Well, okay. Yeah, nuts. We got. You can think of it too. Yeah, the the pseudo is up and down. No, there is dagger when you write the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of this. No, no, you're right. There's a dagger because this is an ambush thing, so there's a dagger inside. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, yeah. So the C component represents the difference between whole, you know, different u squared minus v squared. Exactly. Yeah. It's diagonal. And then the other guy, the, the x component, for example, tau x, will give you u times v, where u stops. Yeah, I'm going to go into that, but uh, I mean, is this a, is this a wrong? I don't want to offend anyone. Do you put a dagger on that? I don't okay. know, maybe yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no? So now, I knew, you know, I could talk about physics and, uh, and experiments all day long, but as soon as I get the dagger in the wrong place, this audience is going to light up. Um, so, uh, we, should, we should consider the moral of this story. Uh, I don't know what that is, but we should find one. Okay. Um, but yeah, the essence of, of the physical picture is to think of this state as, as mapping into spin up and this one as mapping into spin down. <coughs> um, so then uh, we can then rewrite the BCS Hamiltonian in this spin language and the, um, just the single particle uh, energy eigenstates uh, now become a Z component of magnetic field. And if we shift the zero of, of energy is convenient to do to make um, the Fermi energy equal to zero energy, um, then this effective magnetic field um, is it, uh, depends upon K and uh, it, it depends linearly on, on K as, as shown here. So um, yeah, I want to emphasize that this picture, although seemingly trivial I know to you guys, but it's a very powerful way of representing what happens um, when uh, in the dynamics of a superconductor. And I don't have this in my references, but some of you, especially interested in cold atoms, um, may be aware of the uh, papers by Spivak um, talking about, um, and collaborators, uh, talking about um, basically uh, relating to Leo's lecture, where you're able to make a sudden change uh, in, the, in the pairing interaction. And um, it's a very powerful way of analyzing the subsequent response uh, to think of this Anderson pseudo spin picture and think of this how these spins evolve in time due to torques <coughs> applied by effective magnetic fields. So that's really one of the reasons why I want to talk about this uh, is to motivate you to think about those non equilibrium, uh, nonlinear problems, and also relating to the Higgs mode. Um, so then the, the reason this, this picture is so convenient is that now the, uh, the reduced BCS interaction just maps into a, uh, uh, a uh, exchange interaction, ferromagnetic exchange interaction between spins, um, but between their, their XY projections. Okay? So what you have is then a physical picture of spins, uh, spin one half, uh, under an applied magnetic field in the Z direction, um, with an XY ferromagnetic exchange interaction. So it's a very beautiful picture. Uh, so the, spir the spins experience this. Uh, so you can then, what Anderson did then was just to treat this as a, uh, uh, a mean field theory. And of course, mean field theory is going to be very accurate in this model because what you see is that each spin is a completely the opposite situation of the nearest neighbor interaction. Because now instead of just spins aligning with their nearest neighbor, each spin, which is now, you know, represents a K space, interacts with all the other K states. So it's an extreme mean field limit. Mean field theory should be very, uh, give you the very accurate picture of what's going on here. So this, this interaction, now this BCS interaction, creates a tendency for spins to want to flop down into the XY plane and line themselves up. So there's basically two competing terms Yes? Oh, thought I heard something. 
so the, uh, if you visualize the mean field solution, um, then in the normal state, when you don't have this exchange interaction, um, the spins for negative energy uh, will point up and for positive energy will point down. This just means that below the Fermi energy, the states will be doubly occupied. Uh, and above the Fermi energy, uh, the states will be unoccupied. And then the BCS theory, uh, we turn on the BCS interaction. Well, these states right at the Fermi energy uh, experience no Z field. So they flop down into the XY plane. Uh, so they lie in the XY plane. And then away from that, you have this uh, competing interaction. So you get a spin texture that looks like this. What I find really elegant about this picture is it shows you directly the idea of the uh, breaking of the U1 or phase symmetry. Because the spins lie in this direction. They want to maximize, at the Fermi energy, they want to maximize their overlap in the XY plane. So they can flop down into the XY plane in this direction, but equally they can apply flop down the XY plane in this direction. So the underlying uh, Hamiltonian is invariant with respect to this direction, so that it it's, has the U1 symmetry. When you go into the superconducting state, once the, the spins uh, pick a direction, that's the breaking of U1 symmetry. What, what Anderson recognized was that um, this breaking of U1 symmetry is the underlying uh, origin of the persistent con uh, conductivity and not a magical lack of cancellation uh, of various terms, nor, uh, of course, there's this famous idea of London rigidity, which has something to do with the problem, but again, I think it's a very misleading uh, uh, approach to it. Uh, I mean, obviously, it was very uh, done very, very early and very insightful, but again, I think it just leads to confusion, whereas I think this is really uh, exposes the essence of the phenomenon. And the essence of the phenomenon is something we touched on here, which is what, what Leo mentioned, is that um, since spin up has two electrons in it, and spin down has no electrons, then it's actually the Z component of spin that's essentially equivalent to the number operator within a, within a factor of one. So the number operator is just one plus the Z sigma z. So that factor of one just gives you an irrelevant phase factor. So you can think of uh, the number operator as equivalent to the uh, to sigma z. Um, now sigma z is what generates a rotation um, in, the, in, the, in the plane. So sigma z is the generator of this symmetry in the plane. And so that is actually equivalent to the number operator. Um, so since the number operator generates this rotation of phase, thus the number operator and the phase are conjugate variables. Okay. So that is really the essence of the phenomenon. So um, then, of course, uh, to go further, you have to have an effective term in the Hamiltonian. Uh, because you have to talk about the spatial uh, inhomogeneity in the problem. So since the spins want to align in the plane, there must be a term in the effective Hamiltonian or Lagrangian um, that would cause energy to develop a gradient of this phase. So there has to be a term like this that's proportional to the gradient of the phase squared, and the coefficient is what we call the phase stiffness, or the uh, or some people call it the helicity modulus. I'm thinking about the spin language in very uh, vivid terms. So in Fourier space, you have this sort of term in the Hamiltonian relating the, uh, the superfluid stiffness or superfluid density uh, to these uh, Fourier coefficients of the, of the phase. So because these operators are conjugate, um, you have uh, this relationship where the commutator of, of H with N is just the derivative of, of H with respect to the phase. Also, you have the, the result. You have the result from quantum theory that the time derivative of the number operator is the same commutator of the Hamiltonian with the number operator. So that's going to tell you that um, the time derivative of this number operator is the is the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to these coefficients um, of the uh, of the phase. So therefore, I can write. This time, the time derivative of the number is this derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the phase. 
Now, by charge conservation, um, this time derivative of the number operator is the divergence of the current. So that allows me to finally uh, uh, equate uh, the current density uh, wave vector coefficients with the, um, with the phase, or going back to uh, real space, tells me that um, the current density is this phase stiffness times gradients of the phase. So this, to me, is really the essence of where this, uh, where this superfluidity comes from. And this, this is going to, of course, have to be the, the gauge invariant phase uh, in the case that you have the charged superfluid. The elegant thing about this is that this, this same formulation uh, can be worked in the other way around and basically leads to the Josephson relationship. Uh, that the uh, time derivative of the phase is just the derivative of the Hamiltonian here with respect to the number, which is just the chemical potential. So I'm not sure if Anderson was the first to realize this. Possibly he was. That the same uh, familiar relationship of the Josephson supercurrent uh, that you know about, which emerges, say, from London rigidity or from other, from BCS theory by crank, turning the crank on, the, uh, on those wave functions that we did yesterday, uh, but basically, from a more general perspective, this same uh, argument leads not only to this relationship, but also to the Josephson uh, relation. So I, just, I thought it was amusing to point out, since we're all, in the cube rates, we're all thinking about CDWs these days, and the uh, possible coexistence of charge density wave states and superconducting states. Uh, it's interesting that there's a, a contrasting relationship uh, between the superconductor uh, and the charge density wave. So what we just discussed was that in a superconductor, the, su the current uh, is the gradient of the phase, uh, whereas the, um, uh, the time derivative of the phase gives us, is related to the chemical potential like this. So you know that, um, and probably Subir discussed this, I guess I mentioned this before, um, that a charge de an incommensurate charge density wave um, breaks essentially the same symmetry, breaks U1 symmetry. Um, so you might um, ask the question, um, why isn't an incommensurate charge density wave uh, the same as a superconductor? Because I've emphasized the breaking of U1 symmetry as the origin of the, of the superfluidity. Well, it doesn't turn out to, that way, and um, uh, that would be uh, a, you know, an interesting story in itself certainly having to do with the fact that you have a different kind of pairing uh, in the case of a charge density wave as opposed to a superfluid. But it's interesting that you get sort of a, uh, a dual relationship in the case of the charge density wave, where um, the time derivative of the phase, whereas here is related to the chemical potential, in the case of the charge density wave, the time derivative of the phase uh, is the current, and um, the gradient of the phase is the local charge density. So there's a difference in the electromagnetic properties of the charge density wave as compared to a superconductor. Uh, it's a different phase. Pardon? The phase is, has, a, has a different physical medium. Yes, exactly. Well, that's what, that's what I'm saying. The phase saying. below is more like a phone line. Well, the phase of the charge density wave, I think of it as a position. Position is like a phone line. Yeah. Well, I don't think of it as a phone line, but I think of it as a well, center of mass position. It is a photon because it's a, it's a position of the charge density wave. So if you have a gradient, a spatial gradient, if you compress in the charge density wave, you're creating some charge. That's exactly what I've said. Right. But it's different, very different. <laughs> yeah, it's a different, it's a different, uh, it's, it has the same uh, symmetry, the symmetry, but the phase has a different physical meaning. Yeah, I agree. When yeah. you say how the same symmetry, uh, this also proves that in the superconductor, in the example that you showed us, you essentially break the spin language rotational symmetry, which is phase symmetry. Right. In charge density wave, you break translational symmetry. Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're both called U1, but they're different symmetry. Yeah, okay, I didn't mean to confuse everyone, but I was, you know, I, I said, you know, it just reflects my own uh, thinking of trying to understand, you know, there is the same. Uh, symmetry, and you can see pa you know, it's papers where the, the combined symmetry is U1 times U1, mm -hmm. and yet, as you say, I'm just trying to point out the same thing, that they're very physically different underlying meanings of what this phase is. 
So, okay. So then, this this um, relationship that we discussed, where the uh, current density is related to the gradient of the gauge invariant phase, uh, is the starting point for discussing the optical conductivity that comes about um, from phase from phase fluctuations. So, as I have been saying, this. Uh, this gauge invariant phase is actually can be should be written uh, as a combination of two terms. At least if you want to preserve, you know, not work in any particular gauge just yet, uh, you have to think of it. You can think of it as the, the uh, ha having two terms, each of which um, is gauge dependent, but under a gauge transformation, they change in such a way uh, that this uh, gauge invariant phase stays the same. Shouldn't be charged to read. Okay. So east, I left E star. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess I've got E all over the place. Sorry. So I can also think about this. I can also take um, uh, the curl of both sides of this. And I know that um, if I take the curl of, of, of both sides, I, I end up with uh, the curl of A being B. So I can see that I end up now with, a, with an equation that has gauge invariant uh, terms in it. So uh, since this is uh, gauge invariant and B is obviously gauge invariant, the curl of the, the gradient of the uh, gauge dependent phase has to be itself a gauge invariant quantity. Uh, now for what I learned in school was that the curl of gradient um, uh, is zero. Uh, but I d didn't learn it properly because uh, I th this only applies when you have some scalar field that's essentially single value. But the phase, you know, has this peculiar property uh, that, you know, it's, if you add 2 pi, it stays the same. Um, and so, you, you, as a result of that, of that uh, incredibly crucial aspect of this phase field, um, you can have a topological defect in the phase and you can get a non-zero curl of the gradient. So in terms of the Anderson spin picture, um, you can have a situation where you have a defect where the uh, phase winds either one way for a vortex or winds the other way to create uh, an anti-vortex. And in any case, when you take the curl of this, as you know, uh, you end up with a, a delta function at the origin uh, of this topological defect. So that really what, what this uh, term, uh, what this curl of this current gives us in addition to the B field, which is going to give us the pure Meissner screening, as you know from textbooks, you're also going to get uh, a sum of delta functions, um, which can have either positive or negative sign, depending upon whether they are originate with vortices or, or anti-vortices. Now these vortices are going to play a tremendously important role in the theory of two-dimensional superconductivity and in the idea of uh, phase fluctuations in two dimensions, as we'll see. Okay, so now let's assume that I have uh, vortices and I want to see what is their optical conductivity? How am I going to see evidence that they exist? So I think one of the uh, best ways and simplest ways to think about the optical conductivity in the presence of vortices uh, is to imagine a superconducting ring like this. And I want to consider whether I get an electric field uh, inside this ring, which in the case of a perfect superconductor, you know, I shouldn't have. But if I have, uh, if I imagine I can have a situation where vortices uh, from outside the ring enter the ring, then I'm going to get a buildup of uh, magnetic flux inside of the ring. And, um, that change in magnetic flux, d phi by dt, that comes about when each vortex enters the ring, uh, is going to lead via uh, Maxwell equation to a voltage uh, around the ring, an induced EMF caused by the time dependence of the magnetic flux. And so what is this uh, time dependence of the magnetic flux? It's just the um, magnetic flux quantum uh, times the, the time derivative of the number of vortices that make it inside the, the ring. And the, this time derivative uh, is going to be equal to um, the uh, flux of vortices. So the flux of vortices traveling into the center of the ring 
is just the vortex density NV times their drift velocity times 2 pi r. So then, that's going to lead uh, to an electric field in the, say, phi direction or the, going around the ring uh, that's proportional to the drift velocity uh, and the superconducting flux quantum. So the traveling vortices are going to lead uh, to an induced electric field inside the ring. And, and so they're going to lead to a dissipative kind of, of current and essentially destroy superconductivity. So then we have to consider um, how fast are these uh, vortices moving? Okay, what is their drift velocity? So there's a, a very well-developed phenomenological picture for the motion of vortices in a superconductor. So the way we think about this, as the vortices are moving, uh, they're subject to some uh, viscous damping force um, that's proportional to some viscosity coefficient uh, times their drift velocity. So this is opposing their motion. Um, there's a uh, pinning force. Uh, so this presumably there are defects that can cause the, the uh, that can bind the vortex. So there's some, in general, some uh, force trying to localize them at the position of this defect. And finally, uh, there is a so-called Magnus force. The Magnus force arises from the differential uh, motion of the sup underlying supercurrent and the vortex flow. So it's exactly like, you know, a curveball or frisbee or any. And so the, uh, the the first original treatments of this of this Magnus force were. Uh, the same as in hydrodynamic theory, so the same as the force you know, experienced by a hurricane and a strong wind or any of these hydrodynamical type of problems. Uh, more recently, there's uh, derivations of uh, the Magnus force uh, in terms of the Berry phase. So if you consider uh, many body wave function for a superconductor uh, and imagine adiabatically moving a vortex around uh, in a closed loop, you will find a result that you develop a very phase that is proportional to the number of Cooper pairs inside of that loop. And that, that concept um, is a very general concept that can give you the uh, more microscopic view of the origin of the Magnus force. Um, so as you see here, the Magnus force is, is different in that it depends upon the relative uh, velocity of the superfluid and the vortices. So for example, in superconductors and superfluids, you get a very different uh, situation. Um, in, a, in a superfluid, or indeed any you know, Galilean invariant superfluid type system, um, without, you know, uh, yeah, without viscosity coming from a lattice or without pinning, then what you should observe by Galilean invariance is that the uh, the vortices move in the direction of, it, so of the superfluid, so they're carried along, so that the result in steady state is that the drift velocity of the vortices is equal to the drift velocity of the superfluid. So everything just goes along uh, together. Now that uh, can happen in principle in a very, very clean superconductor. I don't think there is a superconductor in which that, in fact, is observed. What is observed in superconductors is that the damping term uh, dominates this Magnus force. So what you actually get in the case of, uh, of superconductors is that um, the motion of the uh, vortices is actually transverse to the direction of the superfluid, except there's a tiny uh, tipping angle. So we actually were able to measure that. So you can measure um, the, the Magnus force uh, by, because the, the motion of the vortices is not precisely perpendicular, but it's almost perpendicular. So you, you can actually display this type of, uh, all of this result by just writing down the force equation uh, on a vortex um, by including all of these terms. So here you have the, the superfluid flow like this. And um, so the, vis the viscosity opposes the motion of the, of the vortices and the Magnus force is in the direction perpendicular, um, you assume that you're imposing a superfluid flow uh, that's uh, 
goes like e to the minus i omega t, and you solve the uh, you solve Newton's equation in steady state where the sum of the forces on the vortex uh, is zero, uh, and then you get uh, this result. So you obtain uh, comp two components of the motion, um, one of which which is um, perpendicular to the direction of the flow, uh, and the other which is parallel to the flow. So interestingly, the, the Magnus force term shows up in the direction parallel to the flow. So this is the, this is the component that's very small, uh, the, the motion parallel to the current. And it's the motion perpendicular to the current uh, that's the dominant term. So, um, so then what happens if we go back to our, to our ring is that if we um, have a superfluid flow around the ring like this, then we're going to um, get a net motion uh, drift of vortices into the ring like this, and, and that's going to build up an electric field that's transverse to their motion like this. So we're going to end up with an electric field and a current that's parallel. So that's telling us that, that we have Ohm's law. <coughs> so we have a, an electric field that's going to be just proportional and parallel to the applied supercurrent. So what we've done now is basically recovered uh, essentially the electrodynamics of a normal metal, even though we have a superconductor, and that we have a dissipative uh, response. So if we just use this, uh, we have the we solve for the current uh, and the electric field. So we basically solve for the, re the resistivity of the system, and uh, we can write this uh, resistivity in this form shown here. And this is known as the flux flow resistivity of a superconductor that contains vortices. Um, so one thing to note is that there's a hint of a, of a uh, concept. Uh, in this expression that was obtained a long time ago of, a, of an idea that became much more famous later on. The idea that there's a sort of uh, duality in the case of a, of a superconductor um, between uh, particles and vortices. So this became very uh, important and influential um, largely in the work of uh, Matthew Fisher and collaborators because this was a crucial idea in formulating a theory of the um, of the superfluid to insulator transition in two dimensions, where um, you could think of the just as you think of the uh, superconducting state as a condensate of particles, you can think of the uh, insulating state as a condensate of vortices. And the reason I mention all of that is that this is sort of hinted at in this uh, picture of the flux flow resistivity when you write it this way. Because um, if I, for example, if I don't have this pinning term, kappa, then I just obtain a, um, a flux flow resistivity that's just proportional to uh, the number of vortices and the, uh, the flux quantum squared. So this looks sort of like the uh, famous Druder relationship for, the, for particles, except it's backwards because for for quasiparticles, uh, the, it's the conductivity um, that is proportional to the to the number of electrons times their their charge. So there's a reciprocal relationship in the uh, linear response, the conductivity of particles and vortices that's, that's illustrated here. Let's see if I mentioned this. In the... Sorry, one question. So in the limit that eta is small, we should be recovering the situation as in a neutral superfluid where the, the, flux, the flux flow is along the same direction as the supercurrent? Uh, yeah, the eta gets small. Yeah. Okay, and there's, and, there's, and there's a diverging flux flow resistance in that case? Where is, like, where is the electric field from? Um, yeah, the electric field is going to be in essentially in the other direction. So you're essentially going to get in the limit that the vortices would flow um, perpendicular to the superflow, mm -hmm. then in that limit you would get no uh, electric field parallel to the current. So it would be like your 
flux flow resistivity was infinite or something like that. Well, you don't call it that, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, but you, you would get precisely, you, your, your vortices would be flowing this way, so your electric field would be this way. Right. So you would be completely dominated by the Hall response in that case. So your Hall angle, so you could think of it as a Hall angle. So that's what we measured in, in the cube rates a while ago. And we found the Hall angle was tiny. Um, and it's actually not really theoretically understood. Uh, actually, you know, if people that are interested in the cube rates, I mean, the, the vortices do have anomalous properties in the cube rates. And there's always been a suspicion that, um, that, their, that their dynamics were influenced by the fact that instead of, you know, instead, because instead of viewing, in, in BCS you view the, the core of the vortex as quote unquote normal metal you know, with essentially a, you know, a Fermi surface and everything. Whereas in the cube rays, you know, you turn on a magnetic field at low temperature, in the vortex core, uh, presumably you have some novel state, you know, perhaps a check, you know, well, we know it could well be a checkerboard, uh, or a charged density wave of some form. Uh, and, you know, the, the electrodynamics are such that you're trying to, you know, transport this object. So, the Ultimately, the microscopic theory of what is the Magnus force, uh, what is the dissipation uh, of a moving vortex, should require, uh, you know, maybe a microscopic picture of what's going on in the vortex core, and maybe the electrodynamics of vortices in the cube rates are anomalous because their their core is, is some sort of anomalous, you know, state. Um, but yeah, the simple. I, in the answer, when the when the viscosity become, when you're dominated by the Magnus force, the vortices uh, flow along the direction of the flow, and the the electric field is developed perpendicular. Uh, you have a Hall angle of 90 degrees, and and you're you're dominated by the the transverse uh, rho x y or sigma x y. Okay, but in particular, rho x x would be zero or um, I think rho, rho x. Um, Um, if, you, if you have a conductivity that's just off diagonal, mm -hmm. then you should get an off diagonal resistivity as well. <laughs> Why should I have a, a diagonal? I mean, the, the, the quantum Hall state, I get. I get zero. Right. Get, yeah, when you have a, a, a finite, finite Hall conductivity and zero longitudinal conductivity, you'll get zero longitudinal resistance. So I'm just I'm just trying to understand this expression. Yeah, maybe I should go back to let me go back to the infinity Let's see if I go back to this one. So this is the uh, this is the transverse motion, uh, and this is the motion that's parallel. So in the case you're saying if I if this is now zero. Um, so if I go to the super Galilean superfluid case where there's no pinning and no, I, I guess this is not a well-defined problem here. Like if the denominator is just zero, if I ignore both pinning and viscosity. Right. Well, then I'm going to get, you know, in that case I get the Galilean invariant okay. result. Um, yeah, it just seems it has a funny lift. It, it doesn't yeah, I have to think. I haven't thought about, it, but it'd be interesting to work. You know, to think that through. Yeah. Yes, if you mention the duality, it's also nice to use it to understand Magnus force. With the duality, uh, density of electrons, the Cooper pair generally, looks like flux density yeah, okay. in the magnetic field. And so vortices mm -hmm. just move in the magnetic field. In the, in the yeah, okay, that's a good, that's a good picture. Okay. So that's related to this very phase picture, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, that's a really good, that's a good way of thinking about it. Okay, so I guess this is a little related to what Sam was saying. I have here, uh, um, yeah, for, um, for pin vortices, um, then maybe that, yeah, so what I'm saying here is that if I look at the K, um, yeah, I don't know if this is, this offending equation here. Uh, see, um, so what do we have that? Um, so the 
Fronts flow is like uh, so then uh, as if, if I look at this zero pinning, um, then I'm going to have um, rho flux flow is going to be I omega. And the so um, yeah. No, this is uh, yeah. Okay. I see if I multiply um, the low frequency limit be eta to the number of things. Is what? The low frequency limit? Eta to times omega is negative. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I have this backwards, right? So um, yeah, I don't want that limit. So, um, right, and the limit that kappa goes to zero, yeah, that's the wrong, this is, so the limit that, that kappa goes to zero, I have just what I had before. I wanted to consider the other, the other limit in case. But then I can see over here, right, so then, um, Pen warranty. So then, um, if I have, let me consider the limit um, that this doesn't go to zero. So I have this is also equal to what I wrote over here, i omega n warranties phi zero squared <coughs> over i omega theta plus kappa. So then, if I take the limit that omega goes to zero. Okay, then this term uh, I can neglect. So I just get um, I omega T zero squared over kappa. So that is the same as the inertial response of the superconductor. Um, so this here, uh, again, corresponds to the infinite uh, superfluid <coughs> response. The fact that, as I mentioned in the other lecture, when rho goes as I, I omega uh, in the low frequency limit. So what that tells us that is that if we have pin vortices, that doesn't destroy the superconducting state. So if I go back to my optical conductivity, what I get in the, in, in, if I have a, a case of vortices or pin, I still have a superconducting delta function, but I have some extra optical absorption or dissipation due to the motion of these pin vortices. Okay, so that's one way that I can maintain the superconducting state. The other way that I can have a superconducting state in the presence of vortices beyond pinning them uh, is if they bind. Okay, so th there's an attraction between um, vortex and anti-vortex pairs. And a bound pair of, of vortices of opposite sign has no net vorticity. So they don't experience magnus force and they're not going to drift under the influence of the, of the supercurrent. So therefore, when these guys are bound together, uh, there's no destruction um, of, the, of the superconducting state. However, uh, when I have unbound vortices, then I'm going to destroy the zero resistance state because I, if I go back to my physical picture here, <laughs> The, the vortices and anti-vortices are going to experience the opposite uh, sign of the Magnus force, and they're going to lead to, uh, each one of them, of course, leads to the opposite sign of the change in flux inside my loop. So both contribute equally to the change in flux uh, under the application of a supercurrent. So in this case, I'm going to get 
Uh, even though I don't have any applied magnetic field, I have equal amounts of positive and negative vortices, I'm going to get what's known as a vortex plasma, and that's also going to destroy the superconducting state. Okay, so this is a result I've already stated. Um, so for free vortices, we found uh, that this result for the flux flow uh, resistivity. Uh, if I can ignore the, uh, the off-diagonal response, which I, I can in the case of superconductors, the uh, flux flow conductivity uh, is just the reciprocal of this. And notice that this, this flux flow conductivity you know, diverges as the number of vortices uh, goes to zero. So, this, so the, the, the key result here is that um, if I uh, started off with a superconducting state in which I have a delta function in my optical conductivity that stands for the uh, infinite conductivity of the superconductor, if I now have free vortex, uh, a, free, a, free, a gas of free uh, vortices, equal amounts, it doesn't have to be equal, but I have uh, without an applied magnetic field, I'll have uh, equal positive and negative vortices. Um, this um, delta function is going to not be a delta function anymore. It's going to broaden, and it's, I'm going to call that a pseudo-delta function because it's different than the Druda conductivity we spoke about earlier. It's, it's a remnant. It's coming about from the superfluid uh, density. It's coming, it, it, is, it has a spectral weight directly related to the phase stiffness that I spoke about earlier, except now it acquires a width. Uh, and what I want to consider now is, um, you know, what is, uh, what is this width? Yeah. Why does it have a width, width of this uh, little gap gaussian have to do with the superfluid stiffness? It has to do only with the vortex uh, uh, density. Well, not the width, the, the area. Why not? So how do you see that the area is concerned? Um, yeah, I don't know how, how to, yeah, how, how, I'm not sure how to prove that, except to say that this is coming, uh, you know, where else would this go, basically? So these are, I guess, okay, well, the, um, the approach that is, is done, let me see if this will answer your question. The, 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 uh, the, the work in which this was done carefully uh, is this uh, famous paper by Halpern and Nelson. That's one of the references that I posted. So, um, what they actually did was to do this, uh, of course, being Halpern and Nelson, they did this um, correctly. And um, what they did was to um, imagine a gas of vortices. Um, they wrote down uh, the, they started with time dependent Ginzburg Landau, they put in a Langevin noise term. They calculated the phase-phase the uh, correlate, uh, and then you know you do the Fourier transform of that, uh, you obtain the, the conductivity. So basically, linear response um, <coughs> by looking at the, the JJ correlator, writing the J as a gradient of a phase, and so that leads to the results I'm, uh, that, that I'm presenting, um, but. So I'm basically arguing, making a physical picture that under the that this is approaching, you know, as I, um, you know, as the as the vortices are moving slower or there are fewer vortices, this is going to collapse into this delta function. So therefore, I'm sort of taking it as an axiom that this spectral wave is conserved as it broadens from this delta function. So in that sense, it's no longer superconductor. Precisely. Yes, that's right. So. So that was, you know, actually the point of the Kosterlis-Salas theory was that, you know, uh, that this that this state, you know, is connected directly to a normal metal. There's only so you have only one symmetry. You have only breaking of U1 symmetry uh, in this. So you can only break this once. And so, um, you know, once you get into this uh, this gas of positive and negative vortices. This is symmetry equivalent to the normal state. There's no more phase transitions. So right. from a symmetry perspective, uh, this, is, this state here is, is a state of uh, a gas of positive and negative vortices moving all around um, is equivalent to the normal state. 
And in fact, you can think of the writing it as a gas of positive and negative vortices, as, so there's a choice of basis, which is not unique uh, representation of, of the normal state. Yes? Um, so the, the picture of vortices as the topological excitations here is a two-dimensional yeah. prejudice, right? So if we had like a truly three-dimensional superconductor, they should be like, like loops, yeah. vortex loops? Right. Okay. And Zlatko worked on a lot of the theory of that, among others, but I think he did some. So trying to look at the departures, I mean, I guess the point would be to look at departures from mean field theory by studying the three-dimensional superconductor as a gas of loops that can, I mean, you have, since they can do that, you know, it gets, I think there are a lot of, and Sudbo, I think is another name that did, uh, you know, various numeric, you know, gets into be a numerical problem. Uh, so to recover the, the deviations from mean field theory, I mean, it's, it's not a very well experimentally motivated problem because the, the three-dimensional superconductor is so mean field-like in general. But from a conceptual point of view, uh, the, the melting or the, the, the phase transition ultimately has to be the proliferation of topological defects as opposed to just, you know, the, you know, that, that has to be ultimately the mechanism once you get close to the true transition. And that's true even, I guess, of quasi 2 dc conductors as well, right? If you have a, a, a diversion curve. Right, so there's also work on, in, yeah, well, I think Steve, well, I mean, a lot of it, yeah, uh, Erica worked on, you know, yeah, the, the, you take 2D, 2D layers and, uh, and imagine a weak Josephson coupling and then consider you know, how the, the various 2D to 3D crossovers that, that are involved there and so forth has been a field of study. Yes? I'd say 3D, just to add to this, it's, I mean, it's really just a dual, there are two languages and they're complementary and sometimes it's easy, one language is more productive than the other. One way to think of a phase transition is penetration of topological defects, you coming from the ordered side, and the other is come from the disordered side and see how things order. Right. So they're sort of just complement each other. And, and right. you know, where they overlap, they totally, they totally you know, well in different systems. Uh, well, this is Jeff Kaplan. Um, how it's defined? I know, how, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm going to give a back of the envelope calculation of this, which again, you should, I refer you to Halpern and Nelson for the, the derivation of this. Right, exactly. So uh, just uh, related to that question, so a yeah, key part of my argument to make this, to now have to go through the, the, the calculation which, uh, of the, that, that Halpern and Nelson did, that was also based on earlier work with Amba Gokar, Sidja, and I think Halpern and Nelson. Um, on the dynamics of vortices and superfluid. Um, but uh, yeah, so without to spare us going through all of those details, I was going to argue that the spectral weight uh, is conserved. Okay. So once you allow me to say that the spectral weight is conserved, uh, since I know from this phenomenological perspective, I know the peak value, I can tell you what the, what the, um, what the width is. Okay, so I want to argue that um, spectral weight is conserved, and therefore uh, the value at DC, which is the flux flow conductivity, uh, times the width, which is the reciprocal of, of this time, that I'm calling the phase correlation time, is just my original superconducting spectral weight. So from that argument, I find that um, I basically get uh, the, uh, a width, which is the reciprocal of this phase correlation time, that's proportional to the number of vortices um, times the, the helicity modulus over KT times D, which is the vortex diffusivity. So what I've done here is to take the, uh, the vortex viscosity term here, but the vortex viscosity is just the reciprocal of the vortex mobility, and then use the Einstein relation to relate um, the uh, vortex mobility to the diffusion coefficient. So that's just short-circuiting this whole Langevin, you know, noise term calculation, which ultimately is just going to give me uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which gives me the Einstein relation. So I'm just basically writing that down and putting the diffusion coefficient here. 
Uh, now, you know that uh, the key result of postural Lasalle's theory is that the superfluid density or the phase stiffness at the transition is, uh, becomes of order of the temperature. Uh, so that tells me that in the neighborhood of the superconducting transition temperature, this coefficient is just about order unity. Uh, so I get this uh, result that I'm after, um, that, the, uh, that this width of this pseudo-delta function is just the reciprocal of this phase correlation time, and this rate uh, of, of loss of phase coherence uh, is just the number of vortices times their diffusion coefficient. So this, you can think of this quite physically at the phase correlation time is just the amount of time it takes for a vortex to diffuse a distance equivalent to the vortex, uh, vortex separation. So when I have a dilute, if I have a dilute density of vortices that move very, very slowly, I'm going to have a very long phase correlation time. And conversely, if I have a dense uh, fluid of vortices that move rapidly, I'm going to get a very short phase correlation time. So the punchline essentially of this is that if you can now measure uh, the uh, area under this peak, you're going to get the equivalent to the spectral weight of the superfluid. And if you can measure either the peak or the width, you're going to obtain um, the phase correlation time. So this became uh, very important uh, in the context of high TC from the very early Times, you know, beginning with a lot of uh, um, effort, you know, contributed to by a lot of people, uh, to, such as Uemura in the very early days and many others. Uh, these concepts were crystallized uh, in this uh, famous paper by Emery and Kibbelson uh, in confronting some of the anomalous properties of the cube rates, um, where it was known, uh, in, you know, back in '95 that you had a dome of superconductivity and a line somewhere in this plane uh, below which you have very anomalous properties. And then the question was, could you understand um, the essential aspects of this region of the superconductor uh, as a manifestation of local superconductivity? So a little bit like what I've been calling phase fluctuation superconductivity. So although uh, they didn't really spell this out there, I think they were very reluctant to to be too specific, but taken literally, this maps directly into the coster lasalle problem and leads you to speculate um, that this region over here is basically characterized by a gas of positive and negative vortices diffusing around. And this picture became, it was taken very literally and it um, motivated a tremendous number of, of experiments, including some of, of my experiments that I'm going to tell you about um, some point. Sorry, one question. Yeah. So the, the expression for the, the phase correlation time, you have the density of vortices times the diffusion constant. Yeah. So you know at the actual cost, and this was at roughly at the cost of the transition temperature. So if you have a, a gas of a vortex, vortices and anti vortices, a neutral vortex plasma, I guess, which is unbound above the transition, but those don't all go away below the transition. Right. They all, at the transition, they become bound. They become yeah, I don't have any free ones. So the, the, the costulous style of transition is when they, they, they are all bound. Okay, so the, so the N sub V that appears in that expression for tau phi is the, is the density of free vortices. Right. Okay, so, um, yeah, so there, you know, once you, um, okay, so I'm going to touch on this, but the, the free, you know, once you get into the, um, once you get into the normal state, you have bound vortices and free vortices. And, of course, whether they're bound or free actually is a length and frequency dependent uh, phenomenon. And that has to do a lot with what the Halpern-Nelson theory was all about, you know, that you, and that's what I'm going to touch on, that you have a superfluid density, you can have a bare superfluid density, but you have, you can define superfluid density as a function of the probing length and, and time scales. So on certain time scales, yeah, so if I take this gas of vortices in the normal state um, that's diffusing around, if I probe it on a length scale, on a time scale, that
that's short compared to the time of their motion, it's going to look electrodynamically exactly like a superconductor. So then on that length, on that time scale, you would say that it's essentially bound or, Im or pinned or immobile. Yeah. So that's high, say high frequency. High frequency, yeah. So um, at this point, let me try to re review um, what we've learned about the optical conductivity of the superconductor from this additional perspective uh, that one, in, a, in the case of uh, two-dimensional systems, low-dimensional systems, or exotic superconductors, uh, it may be interesting to go beyond the VCS mean field theory. Um, so what we've seen is that um, in the case of mean field theory, you get a pretty simple picture for the optical conductivity that's known as the mattis bardeen picture. So I'm just looking, just showing schematically what we discussed last time. So in a superconducting state, uh, the conductivity in general has three components. It has the delta function re representing the persistent superfluid current. Uh, then it has a, uh, an absorption that onsets at two delta that appears in the standard BCS theory only in the presence of impurities that violate momentum conservation and become arbitrarily small in the, place of, in the case of the clean superconductor. And then you, at intermediate temperatures, you have an extra contribution that comes from thermally excited positive particles. So this is the entire story for the mean field theory of a classic uh, superconductor. But then you know that in two dimensions, uh, in the case of, say, a homogeneous um, superconductor, you have uh, the, the case where the transition is better described uh, becomes non-mean field-like. You, you, um, conceptually, you would think of it uh, as a costulous thallus transition. Um, and the work that I've been referring to a lot by Halpern and Nelson was uh, a work in which they took the underlying um, costulous thallus theory of vortices and put it in the context of a charged superfluid uh, and worked out some of the consequences for the electrodynamic response. So in one paper, one very beautiful paper, they analyzed both the, the optical conductivity that I discussed earlier and the other limit as well, which was the diamagnetic response, also uh, how that would appear in, in the costerless thallus theory. And, the, and of course, they're, they're intimately related. So, uh, and then uh, there's a, a, another picture that, that Steve Kimmelson has emphasized that it's possible uh, relationships in various kinds of superconductors that comes about in the case of spatial inhomogeneity, uh, which he's proposed and other people have proposed uh, is a really crucial ingredient um, in uh, uh, sort of highly correlated superconductors uh, in which you can have fairly extreme uh, spatial inhomogeneity of the superconducting order parameter. So the consequences for the, uh, for the optical conductivity of these three cases <coughs> are shown here. So in the mean field theory, um, things are very simple. Um, you have the sudden appearance of the superfluid stiffness at the uh, mean field transition temperature here. So you have an increase in the superfluid and a corresponding decrease in the normal fluid density such that the total spectral weight uh, is conserved and you get this kind of optical conductivity. Now, in the case of the uh, costulous thallus theory of the homogeneous superconductor, uh, then you have, if you have a mean field temperature over here, T mean field, your actual uh, transition is suppressed relative to that uh, by essentially phase fluctuations. Uh, you have an intermediate regime between this transition, uh, between the costulous thallus transition temperature and the mean field temperature that as we've been discussed is best thought of as a uh, plasma, uh, a neutral vortex plasma. Um, and in between, what I've illustrated with these curves here is that the, the, the superfluid density measured in the limit of zero frequency, so you may call, call that the, uh, the true superfluid density, uh, has this famous costerless thallus jump uh, at the transition, and the jump to zero takes place when the superfluid uh, stiffness has been reduced to, re to reach, to become of order of the temperature. And when that condition is reached, you get this rapid uh, self-sustaining positive feedback unbinding of vortices. The more 
as you, as you increase the temperature and you unbind a vortex, uh, anti-vortex pair, that free pair screens the interaction between the other vortices and this thing runs away uh, through a positive feedback mechanism and gives you this sudden collapse of the superfluid stiffness. However, uh, as I mentioned to, to Sam, if you now probe the system at higher and higher frequencies, it acts like a superfluid and eventually if you probe it, you know, in the limit, you probe it very, very fast, you would recover uh, the mean field superfluid density going up to this point. But uh, what's been emphasized in the context of classic superconductors is that this, this uh, range here is actually quite small. And it's very small because the cost in general of making a vortex in a, in a superconductor is very high. Uh, so this, this leads uh, to, to the fact that this range of this transition is rather narrow, especially in clean superconductors. Um, however, um, you can get this, uh, this range to become arbitrarily large in the case uh, when you have an inhomogeneous superconductor. Uh, could you state yes. the relation between Tau and Maru? Like, uh, uh, Pardon? In the, could you repeat the relation between... Uh, or I, didn't, I didn't mention the, the, the bottom. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so this, um, what I forgot to mention. Yeah. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is the formation of this pseudo-delta function as I cool. Right? So, so as I start way up here, I'm in the normal state characterized by a Druda conductivity. As I start to reach this point here, mean field theory would tell me that I immediately get a delta function. However, Koster Lutz-Thalas, Halpern Nelson theory tells me that this, what would be the delta function acquires a width because I have uh, phase fluctuations. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is the buildup of this pseudo-delta function in this range here, which at this temperature here, I should see a jump. I should see this delta function suddenly appear at this temperature, but with a, with a non-zero uh, spectral weight. Yes? Two uh, questions. Did anyone really observe this jump in by measuring imaginary part of conductivity and looking at the slope of one of them? Um, I think Hebert and Fiore came, came, did, saw something like this. I'm not sure. Um, and of course, you know, we saw, I think we did the best look at this. <laughs> this is a, a tape on the So, um, yeah, I think, so we, in the Kubrick's, I think we looked careful. I'll show you what we saw. Certainly, you know, Bishop and Repi, in the case of helium, observed the the costerless style has jumped beautifully in the case of the neutral superfluid. But I guess it was done by measuring major part of conductivity. No, I'm talking about the neutral superfluid. Ah, they, 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 they did the torsional oscillator <coughs> experiments, measured the, yeah. Sure, but... I mean, the charged superfluid, yeah. I, I, I think... Um, Just looking at oh, one of our point of them I, I think that's I think that that's what uh, Hebert and Fiore were looking at. Uh, and of course, Beasley worked on this a bit. Uh, I'm just funny because I don't know the simple statement of how how close. So typically, the costerless stylus people say that there are dirty superconductors that obey costerless stylus theory quite well, and this is done by, as you know, the temperature and magnetic field scaling of the resistivity and these things all collapsing, which is basically the Halper-Nelson theory again for the divergence uh, of the of the phase correlation time. But to actually nail the superfluid density jump, I'd have to check. But I would check with this uh, Art Hebert and Tony Fiore stuff. I can get back to you on that. Um, right. So, uh, so Andre is pushing me to go from cartoons to the real world. Um, so in the case of the, uh, of the, the granular or um, spatially inhomogeneous superconductor, then in principle there's no limit on the distance between the mean field superconducting onset and the costerless stylus because the, you can think of the mean field transition as the temperature at which one of these uh, islands of superconductor would become a, a superconductor. But it, um, for, the whole, for the film to go superconducting as a whole, 
uh, that's going to require uh, coupling in between grains. So you can, you can have the, the, the difference by engineering your sample or maybe by nature doing this for you. Uh, you can have um, you know, an arbitrarily large uh, 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 contrast between the intergranular connection and the mean field temperature. And that will broaden this regime of the vortex plasma to become arbitrarily large. Another interesting case that, that Steve and his collaborators have worked on uh, is the famous case of LBCO, where you have um, a frustrated coupling between layers that form a stack. Now each, instead of a, a grain here, I have a two-dimensional superconductor, but it has an incredibly weak Josephson coupling to the next layer, also giving me this enormous range of, um, of uh, fluctuating superconductivity. So again, relating this to, to my cartoon here, um, what this is, is, is trying to illustrate is that, in this case, the other signature of this case is that um, my superfluid density, or the spectral weight of my delta function, when it finally condenses, is going to be uh, very small, because that has to reflect the energy scale of J. So this delta function is going to be weak, and only a tiny fraction of the spectral density available in these superconducting grains is going to finally uh, collapse into the delta function. Sorry, if you, I mean, this is sort of interesting in terms of like the, we, we set k equal to zero long ago. K. Right, the, the momentum. Uh, the, the wave vector of the probe. The, the wave vector of the probe, right. So if you look at this, at a granular system with sufficiently large momentum, or like if you, if you somehow had like a small spot size or looked at shorter distance information, you should see a fre shouldn't you see a frequency dependence that's more characteristic of a single grain? Yeah. Right. right. And so I think people are, that, that's a really good point. And I think that's, that sort of represents the, the holy grail of this field in a certain sense. Uh, because you have, a, you have a powerful probe whose frequency is just where you want it. Because we're talking about probes, I'm talking about probes where h bar omega is on the order of KTC. So what could be better? But then when you when you look at light, um, the wavelength of the light at that frequency is like a millimeter. So this is very disturbing. So, um, but people are working towards this, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, Dmitry Basov is, you know, is uh, you were at the so he's he's doing quite a lot of notable work of trying to. Uh, it's to do some tricks and um, basically to do optical spectroscopy beyond the diffraction limit using you know various tiny antennas to, to do exactly that uh, and probe this on the short length scales. Um, yeah, I mean the only other approach that people try, you know, which is going to be very difficult to, to probe this, is by inelastic scattering you know, RITs in principle and look at low energy scales uh, and high momentum scales. But, you know, of course then you're looking in the Fourier domain, so it would be, it would be fantastic if you could probe this uh, um, on a short lane scale. So maybe we could write a proposal. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you in the insulating state of a granular system, detect the current of Cooper pairs between the grains. In the insulating part, yeah. Not, uh, let's assume you are staying uh, in non superconducting state, so there's no phase cuttings between grains. There's no phase, yeah. Right. Uh, but uh, there's still current of Cooper pairs between grains. Can you detect that contribution? Well, yeah, I mean, that. You should be, I mean, that presumably would show up in various, uh, well, it probably, you know, indirectly. So that's exactly this regime here, right? Yes. Yeah, so that where you get in Cooper. So um, certainly, you know, people have seen that with magneto resistance. And so basically the main approach, as I mentioned earlier to, to Andre, to actually nailing this, uh, originally was to just measure the resistance and see the scaling with magnetic field and to test it against this various scaling predictions of Costa-Lazalus. 
But more recently, um, I think there has been some electrodynamical work on granular superconductors. I think Peter Armitage has written on this. So that the experimental proof would be you know, the observation of something like this and the observation of this uh, pseudo-delta function in the, in the optical conductivity. Also, the fluctuating, also you should get a, a certain diamagnetism in a system like that. Uh, well, I would expect, uh, just if I'm not talking about the delta function, I would expect uh, some omega square or omega contribution yeah. from to the pair hoping that the neighboring grains. Do yes. I see that? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me? Um, uh, so experimentally, how do you distinguish the, the fluctuating granular picture and the uh, Operating Experimentally. Like, is the res resolution now? Well, um, you know, I, I think that the, uh, the essential, I guess you, if you study this, you know, systematically, I mean, in the case of the, in the case of the homogeneous superconductor, there's fundamentally only one energy scale, which is TC. So there's a, there's a very, you know, these two things are going to track each other and going to be intimately connected. And you'll never separate them. So the, I think the key distinction between these two cases is that fundamentally you have two energy scales here and just one energy scale here. So experimentally in a laboratory, I mean, if you you can, um, and this is what was done in the case of granular superconductors by making indium oxide films and varying the amount of oxygen as you evaporate the indium, you can continuously tune uh, this J. And you should see, you know, that you get one characteristic temperature, which is the TC of the indium, which doesn't change, and the other characteristic temperature, which is the J, which you can drive all the way and then ultimately go to the to the superconductor insulator phase transition by just completely destroying superconductivity at all. Uh, sorry, a sec second question is in the upper right panel, what does the uh, dash line mean? The weak in the upper right here. Yeah. This would be uh, the Sorry. superfluid density if you just had a homogeneous material made up of these grains. Yeah, I mean the, the other. <laughs> the upper. But the other one. These? Yes. This would, these, this would be the superfluid density you would measure uh, if you, so you, me you can measure superfluid density by measuring the kinetic inductance. You, put, you know, you apply an AC field, you just measure the inductance. So what I will find in this regime is that my inductance depends on frequency. So the superfluid density that I would write down in my notebook, I'm now going to measure the superfluid density, at, but I'm going to have I'm going to set my signal generator at one kilohertz. But in the next room, there's another person who's measuring it at 10 kilohertz. They're going to get a different kinetic inductance. So in this anomalous region, the value of the kinetic inductance or the inertia of the superfluid, whichever way you want to look at it, is a frequency dependent and length scale dependent phenomenon, where uh, it's, it's not in the superconducting state. So that's, so basically what I'm saying is this is the, this is rho s of, of omega. Yes? Right. Good, thank you. So uh, this is, you yeah, um, so this is a good time because I, I wanted, the next thing I was going to do was to transition into some measurements. Uh, of these properties in the, uh, in, the uh, in the few brain superconductors, and then the last topic I was going to do was was to introduce the nonlinear optics from this perspective of this Anderson model. So I guess I'll do that next time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions right now? Can you say what frequency scales are the relevant experimental Right, so the frequency scales are, are, are set by the, the, uh, the temperature, by the transition temperature. So in the case of, um, of high TC, um, then uh, basically the character, you can think of TC as 100 Kelvin, um, and in which case, you know, just off the top of my head, um, yeah, that's, um, so that's a frequency of about two terahertz. So um, to really explore these properties in the cube rates, 
I I would I would love to look uh, at how I would love to look at the properties how they vary from like 100 gigahertz to 10 terahertz. That would be my dream. That would really nail the problem. And then if you pick your system of interest to scale that down, whatever the, the TC is. I, I think that one of the interesting things about the cube rates is it, it enabled uh, some very good experiments to be done by being able to work in a frequency regime where you could scan the frequency. So like conventional superconductors, these characteristic frequencies scale down to the microwaves. And for microwave spectroscopy, essentially, unless you do some very special things, you need a specific cavity set up for a specific frequency. So I've got a laboratory for 10 gigahertz. <laughs> and if I'm really rich, I can have a laboratory for 10 and 30 gigahertz. So it may, in the old days, everything had to be done at a fixed frequency and sweeping temperature and field. But cuprates enabled more experiments where you could sweep the frequency and learn a lot more. Yes. Uh, um, we have seen that there are these two contributions to um, the current, the dark magnetic and the paramagnetic. And uh, there are also two contributions to the optical conductivity. And in the BCS midfield theory, the, um, the paramagnetic contribution disappears, right? So um, in the limit. Uh, yeah, in the limit of taking first Q equal to zero. Well, actually, in both limits, it should. Yeah, in the, in the, in the yeah. superconductor, it disappears in both limits. Yeah, I, I, I would like to understand if this is an artifact of mean field theory or if it's a general result due simply to the fact that there is a gap. No, it's yeah, well, it's, it, it, it's certainly not due to, so if you, just the gap alone, Right, that was a, the controversy way back when. So, um, so since you're getting the paramagnetic term to go to go away, a uh, simple-minded view would be you know you have that degenerate perturbation theory sum, and you have an energy denominator. The numerator goes to zero, and the denominator doesn't, so it goes to zero. So then people said, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, that tells me that you know any time I have a gap, I'm a superconductor. So, from the perspective of BCS theory, the reason it actually works is that although you have this buildup of states and you conserve states, the matrix elements vanish at threshold. And that's the crucial argument that gets it to be zero, even in the case of the dirty superconductor. So, from, that's what I was saying from the perspective of the BCS theory, the BCS wave functions, you can solve the problem exactly, you get the right answer, but the physical, you know, underlying physics is completely lacking. So it, it all appears in these coherence factors. So the coherence factors, just as their name suggests, has to do with this coherent superposition of these filled and empty states, and the fact that it's the same for all wave vectors. So why does that matter? So to me, that was the, the deep underlying <laughs> mechanism is this conjugate relation between number and phase. So that to me, and, and that was, um, you know, I sort of, you know, it's, it's interesting to read Anderson's reminiscences because, you know, he was, you know, he, I can sort of identify, I can sort of understand where he was coming from. I mean, he was so far ahead that he was answering a question, a deep question before people knew that that was the question. Yeah, and so, but that's my way of thinking. Thanks again.